In our last video of Thinking Ahead Volume 2, I gave you a solo over Wayne Shorter's Black Nile to practice. So today we're going to go over the techniques that we implement throughout the solo. And I'll give you a couple of exercises to work on. Please make sure to watch the previous videos in the series. And remember, Thinking Ahead Volume 1 is available on mdex.com. So the solo starts on measure 33. This is a simple motive with only two notes, B and E. A perfect fourth that bounces back. Short motives like this are called dyads because they are two note structures and they're really easy to develop and adapt to different chords. In fact, coming up with just two notes that fit any chord is actually quite easy. And if you know chord tones and tensions for your chords, it's almost impossible to play wrong notes. Look at all the chord tones from D minor six, D, F, A, and B. And if I play a perfect fourth above any of these notes, only the F to B flat will have a note outside of the D minor six. But the B flat is so short, all the tension that it creates is resolved right away back to F. So the top note in the motive is not as important as the bottom note. And there are a few ways that you can approach developing this motive. For example, you can think of an interval shift. Let's say I decide to move the motive by a half step down. So I would play B, E, B, B, E flat, B flat, A, D, A. And when we look at the notes against the chords in the progression, B flat, E flat, B flat, are E flat 7's chord tones. And A, D, A are also chord tones. And that's exactly what we did in our solo. Moving a motive chromatically down or up is always a good option but it doesn't always work. Had we moved chromatically up, we would have ended on C sharp and F sharp, which sounds terrible on a D minor six. We could also think of the last bottom note as a target. For example, if I wanna target the fifth of D minor six, I can play. So we're approaching the fifth of D minor six with a chromatic passing tone. And yes, this is the exact same thing that we played by thinking by intervals and descending chromatically but now we know our target is going to work. These two perspectives are quite effective. The first perspective is much easier to implement, but the second perspective is always guaranteed to work because we're thinking of a target note. And now that we're looking at the first note in our motive as our target, we can approach it with one of the enclosures that we discussed in volume one. Look at measure 36. We're playing our motive on the flat 13 of our F7 altered. And we're approaching it with an AAB enclosure. Two from above and one from below. Remember, I'm just thinking this, but I'm adding an enclosure before it. And now that we've practiced all those enclosures in volume one, we don't even have to think about them. They're part of our vocabulary. That's why it's so important to practice these concepts every day. They allow us to think less and less about each individual note and more about concepts. And when we play measures 33 to 36 in real time, the only thing that we need to think about is that perfect fourth motive. And then we use the different concepts to develop it across four measures. Now we could just play the motive on the same beats like this, or add some rhythmic displacement and play this. Rhythmic displacement is very intuitive and therefore really easy to come up with. Shifting a motive earlier or later by an eighth note is pretty trivial, but we should still practice doing it to get a better grasp of how our motives feel when placed on different beats. In our solo, we shifted our motive one by an eighth note on measure 34, and then back to beat one on measure 35. And then on measure 36, Motive one was automatically shifted because we use the AAB enclosure. But I guess we could have played this. Now, motive one is placed on a different beat in every measure. On beat one, then on the end of one, then on two, and then on beat three. Mm -hmm. 
Which one is better? Well, it really doesn't matter. What's important is that we understand the concepts so we can develop our own way of using them. So your first assignment is gonna be this. Notice that I only wrote the first iteration. Then I just wrote the targets and rhythms, and then just the targets to force you to think about these concepts when you play. In the solo, we labeled all the motives with M1, M2, M3, and so on, and a short description of other concepts used to develop them. Next, I wanna to touch on the left hand voicings. In this solo, we've used quite a few chordal voicings, so let's talk a bit about them. Usually, we wanna play voicings that offer the current chord's basic sound, so we try to include guide tones and maybe some tensions. So on an E flat seven, we can play this. And we get two guide tones. Or maybe this. And we get a four note voicing with two guide tones and two tensions. But another approach is to think of a specific structure, like a perfect chordal, and play one that works with the chord. For example, if I remove the D flat from our last voicing, I get GCF, a perfect chordal. I know this is gonna work on the E flat seven because I just removed the D flat, so the other three notes should still be okay. Now our voicing does not sound like an E flat seven at all. But that's the whole point. We're now playing an ambiguous sound for the E flat seven that actually works for the E flat seven. Look at measures 33 and 34 from our solo. On D minor six, we're playing A, B, and E, which is nothing else than an inverted perfect chordal. And on E flat seven, we're playing B flat, E flat, and F. Also an inverted perfect chordal. Both of these voicings are ambiguous. By just listening to them, we don't know the type of chord that they're supposed to be with, which makes our mode of one work even better. And remember, the bass is playing the roots of these chords, so we don't even need them in our voicings. Look at the voicings on measures 51 and 52. They're all perfect chords. On F minor seven, we play G, C, F, which are the ninth, the fifth, and the root. On um, B flat seven altered, we play A flat, D flat, and G flat. The flat seven, the sharp nine, and the flat 13. And of course, if you wanna learn more about perfect chordals, you can check out our Upper Structures Volume Two course. As always, all of our members will receive a PDF containing an exercise that accompanies today's video. And if you're not a member yet, go ahead and click on that join button down below. We'll see you next time.